Hello. Okay, hello, good morning. Well, they are sitting. My name is Diana Castro. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, we have the next session we're gonna have. It's about um, clinical, the clinical trials. Dr. Punga said something this morning. You say, I have a dream. I do have a dream too. I have a dream of doing pediatric trials because we need more options. So in this session, we're gonna have some data about adult trials, but we're gonna also talk a little bit about some of what is coming in the pediatric world as well. So we will start with um, Dr. Howard, and it will be talking about the achievement of minimal symptoms expression in acetylcholine receptor antibody positive in uh, ADAPT and ADAPT Plus studies. Please go Thank ahead. You. And we've completed one pediatric trial, and there are two more in development. So, Well, I want to thank the uh, organizational committee for the invitation to talk to you about minimal symptom expression, a concept uh, that originated in 2020 through the REGAIN trial. John Vissing was the lead author uh, of that paper. These are our requisite disclosures. Many of you know that FGARTIGAMOD is, a FC, an, is an FC fragment designed to outcompete immunoglobulin as it binds to FCRN. FCRN in one part is a trafficking molecule that increases the survival time of IgG um, as it is pinocytosed uh, into the cell um, bound tightly to FCRN, re-trafficked to the cell surface, and re-released into circulation. And in doing so, enhances its half-life some four to five times for IgG molecules with this particular compound with no effect on albumin, no effect on other IgG subclasses. If one outcompetes uh, the binding of IgG by inhibiting uh, the FCRN molecule, then free immunoglobulin antibody IgG molecules are shunted to the lysosome for destruction. We're going to talk about today the uh, minimal symptom expression as an outcome measure, and minimal symptom expression are those individuals with an MG activities of daily living score, ADL score, of zero or one, essentially implying that there is no disease. And we're going to look at the ADAPT and the ADAPT Plus and the numbers of patients who achieve that and then look at their demographics of those who did not versus those that did and then look at other quality of outcome measures uh, as well. When we look at baseline characteristics, uh, they're very similar in terms of age in terms of disease duration, gender, et cetera, in those that did achieve MSE and those that did not. When we look at disease class, um, we can uh, see uh, similarities as well, as well as those undergoing thymectomy and being exposed to ISTs or corticosteroids. The one difference that was noted was the baseline at entry into the study in terms of the ADL score. And that's shown here, and I'm not seeing it very well, uh, with the asterisks um, in the baseline ADL score uh, is different. Not overly significantly, um, but there is a clear difference there. And that's the only differentiating feature. When we look at the individuals receiving FGARTIGAMOD versus placebo, one readily sees the marked uh, superiority of active drug versus placebo in the ability to achieve MSC. When we look at other outcome measures in those that achieved uh, MSC at baseline, uh, one sees that it involves the, um, the uh, and I can't read well from here, um, the composite here on the right, uh, the QMG score on the left, with substantial uh, differences. One sees that the minimal uh, the clinical meaningful improvement are three-point changes in both of these measures. So significant deltas um, between baseline and their best score uh, achieved in, um, in MSE. When we look at other 
uh, outcome measures, uh, QOL, uh, quality of life indices, et cetera, one sees very similar patterns, that there is significant improvement, and we compare these to population norms as shown by the dashed line uh, in each of these bars here uh, with uh, baseline scores and those ultimately achieving uh, MSC. And then the MG-specific uh, quality of life instrument, the 15R, the revised, uh, also uh, demonstrates uh, substantial differences between baseline QOL scores and the best value achieved uh, following a therapy with Fcartigamod. When we look at the, um, the open label, the ADAPT plus trial, we see a very similar pattern. Uh, and remember that those individuals completing ADAPT were allowed to roll over into ADAPT plus. The overwhelming majority did so uh, and then were followed. And as you recall, this was a cyclical approach in terms of therapy um, and uh, infusing Fgartigamod weekly for four weeks uh, and then observing over time, one had to have clear deterioration for retreatment, uh, and the interval of retreatment was slightly different in the open label phase uh, compared to the blinded phase, um, but then uh, the individuals are, are um, uh, then followed in a very similar pattern. Uh, when we look at rates of MSC uh, in the ADAPT Plus, and compare that to ADAPT, we find that they're quite similar. Uh, my apologies. Uh, that uh, very nearly similar proportions are having the ability to achieve uh, minimal symptom expression, ADL scores of zero or one. And so in summary, uh, as you can see here, that Fgartigamod is a very rapid, very efficacious uh, therapeutic, improving quality of life uh, and the ability for many of these individuals to achieve uh, substantial uh, improvement, near normal improvement in their examinations, uh, if you will. It's a drug that is well tolerated over time uh, with um, uh, very few or a nominal side effect profile and similar findings are found in both those achieving uh, MSC in the blinded phase versus in the open label phase. And with that, I'll thank you, and we'll take questions at the end and turn this over to Vera Brill. Thanks, Chip, and good morning. And I want to thank the organizers for having... Um, Oops, am I going? Oh. Uh, for um, having us uh, present this work. We're talking about the ADLs and the quantitative myasthenia gravis scores over time in patients who have generalized myasthenia gravis. This is a post hoc analysis of the MyCaring G, the phase three study, and open label studies. These are our disclosures of the authors. Read quickly. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh -huh. <laughs> it is difficult to see this from here. It's impossible. Um, I do have it all written out. <laughs> Sorry. I would like to just have it all memorized, but I don't think I And it's not possible for me to really read the far screen. So thank you, Veronica. Um, we know that rosanaluxizumab is an FC receptor inhibitor. It was approved by the FDA earlier this year for treatment of generalized uh, uh, acetylcholine receptor and musk positive myasthenia gravis based on the results of my caring, which was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study of uh, uh, weekly injections for six weeks of rosanaluxizumab, seven milligrams per kilogram or 10 milligrams per kilogram in adults. 
um, it showed both statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvements in multiple endpoints, and both doses were well tolerated. And after this, patients could be enrolled in open-label studies. The first was a regular treatment study that was then uh, terminated. The second was an on-demand treatment study, open-label. And we're going to look at the results across these studies. This shows the design of um, my caring uh, with the two doses of rosanaluxizumab and placebo, uh, the six weekly injections, and then the observation period with retreatment depending <laughs> I don't know who's at the back there, but I need the lights. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, depending on the uh, worsening status of the patients, on-demand treatment, and patients would receive further cycles of treatment, each cycle once a week treatment for six weeks. So a total of 196 patients had at least one dose of uh, rosanaluxizumab, and um, there were at least two consecutive symptom-driven cycles in 110 patients, and one cycle in 188. So these open-label studies, the second one was ongoing, and this cut point was in, um, I believe it was in July 8th, 2022. Hmm. And, um, all the patients uh, available for follow-up at the time that the slides were prepared, the mean annualized uh, dosing rate was three to four cycles and 17.8 infusions per year based on worsening. This uh, slide shows the um, baseline characteristics of those with moderate to severe MG. You can see about 10% had musk positive MG ADLs were about nine, and QMG was about 16, disease duration of about eight years. And you can see the concomitant therapies at the bottom. This slide shows the results in the ADLs and the QMGS um, with uh, repeated cycles. So in each cycle, you can see similar curves with a decrease in ADLs and the decrease in QMG uh, with each cycle shown to the right. Then what this slide shows you is the cumulative effect after multiple cycles. And you can see that after the first cycle, patients were observed and declined and then were given further treatment with an increase with an increase and then a stabilization of the improvement in ADLs at about um, three points and the QMG of four points. And they stayed that way, that uh, improvement was maintained in a mean across the populations. So that you can see that the improvement in their MG status was maintained during open label therapy across the population. And then the, um, if we look at the treatment emergent adverse events by cycle number, uh, they're shown here. Um, the um, rosanaluxizumab was well tolerated. Uh, the most severe head, uh, TEAs were headache. And uh, one person dropped out of the study the, uh, uh, because of headache, uh, but uh, nobody else. The most frequent were headache, diarrhea, pyrexia, and nausea. Dr. Vu has a poster, number 269, where he will go into the um, adverse events in much more detail. <clears throat> so, rosanolexizumab consistently improved MG-specific outcomes across repeated cycles of treatment, as we've shown. The post hoc analysis showed that the clinically meaningful improvements in the generalized myasthenia gravis symptoms were maintained over time for the cohort across rosanaluxizumab cycles, while individual patients moved through the consecutive treatment cycles. Rosanaluxizumab had an acceptable safety profile that was maintained across repeated treatment cycles, and this is consistent with previous 
results of rosanaluxizumab. So thank you very much. We'll do questions at the end. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present. I'm Sigurd Nelius um, from UCB, Clinical Program Director, and I have the opportunity to present on the pediatric population and our Zilocoplan program with our pediatric studies CMIG+, CMIG and CMIG+. These are our conflicts of interest. So pediatric indications usually have a high and specific therapeutic need, and this is also the case for pediatric MG. Children need approved drugs with appropriate dosing and safety information and this as fast as possible. We have the ambition to address these needs and set up a pediatric-centric clinical program. So what is the basis of our clinical pediatric program? The basis is that Zilucoplan has successfully shown efficacy in adult patients with MG in the phase three race study and was recently approved in US and Japan. The benefit of Zilcopan is a self-administration of a daily subcutaneous injection, a rapid of onset of action within one week, and it can be used concomitantly with IVIG and PECS without supplemental dosing. So our pediatric program, ZMIG and ZMIG Plus, is based on extrapolation of efficacy from the adult studies. And this takes the rarity of the disease, especially in children, into consideration. The extrapolation approach is based on PK and a PD marker, complement inhibition. And this extrapolation enables us to enroll only a few patients into clinical studies. In our case, these are for, uh, at least a minimum of eight patients. The pediatric clinical program has two studies, ZMIG and the extension study ZMIG+. And both are open-label single-arm studies. That means each participant will receive Zilucoplan. It aims to confirm the pediatric dose and to characterize the safety profile of Zilucoplan in children. Eligible participants will enroll in ZMIG for a four-week four treatment period to support the extrapolation approach. PKPD is the primary endpoint of ZMIG, and, um, and since um, Zilucoplan has a rapid onset on action and um, the steady state is already achieved at week four, the study can be very short, four weeks only. After that, patients have the option to transition into the extension study, ZMIG+, to receive Zilucoplan for further, uh, for further 52 weeks. Both studies will also evaluate the activity that is reflecting for the clinical effect of Zilucoplan in children. The number of site visits, uh, you can see here the numbers on the time, um, time period, uh, the number of um, site visits is reduced to a minimum in order to reduce the burden for the participants, their families, but also for the sites. But on the other hand, to evaluate the right dose for the children, but the activity of Zilucoplan and the safety profile in children. As mentioned, PKPD is a primary endpoint of the ZMIG study and safety is the primary endpoint of the ZMIG plus study. Key clinical outcome measures that we summarize as activity of Zilucoplan are MG-specific, such as MGADL and QMG, but also non-indication specific quality of life measures. On the right-hand side, you see we apply an age-staggered approach. This means we have two cohorts, cohort A above 12 years and cohort B below 12 years. And there's a dose confirmation step. So after the first two participants has received Zilucoplan, a PK, PD, a data evaluation will be uh, conducted to confirm the dose 
or to adapt the dose. And only after this is done, the cohort A will continue recruitment and the younger children, cohort B, will start to be enrolled into the study. So again, coming back to the extrapolation approach, the eligibility criteria are reflective of the adult population in the race study. So we have ACHR antibody positive patients, we have an MGFA disease of class two to four, and at the time of screening, adolescents should have an MGADL total score of equal or greater than six, and below 12 here, a muscle weakness in at least one limb, neck, or bulbular muscle, acknowledging the limitations of MGADL in children, especially in younger children. So coming back to our ambition, so what do we want to achieve with our pediatric program? And you see on the uh, left side activities that we initiated far before now the study starts. So we have conducted an adolescence patient council in order to get insights on how uh, adolescents and their family live with, um, with myasthenia gravis. We asked them about design features but also on preferences on drug administration. We worked in the last years with uh, a lot of pediatric MG experts who gave input to the study and helped us to understand the pediatric population and their needs. And we have looked into reword evidence data to gain insights into epidemiology, population characteristic, and treatment pathways. And these data are also important to support, again, the extrapolation approach. And this enables us, the extrapolation approach, that we can conduct small PK, PD, and safety studies. All the insights are also reflected in study design features such as family-friendly assistance, like uh, options for overnight stays, if this is useful, uh, help with transportation, but also using a digital engagement app. And finally, and this is also very important for us, that we have an optimized and reduced assessment uh, and blood sampling schedule, which is also then reflected in the reduced site visit schedule. All that to lower the burden of all participants and the fami families. And all these learnings that we, that we had over the past years, we could also apply in our second program with Rosanulixizumab. Also here we have in parallel a pediatric program, which you can visit on a poster tomorrow in the, during the poster session. Thank you very much, and I hand over to Dr. Fremo. I guess it tests our age to see if we can see that screen there. <laughs> um, so I'm really happy to be here today to talk about another um, evaluation using the drug Zaluka plan. And in this case, what we're looking at are the early responders. And we did an interim analysis of subjects who were in RAISE XT, the extension phase of the Zaluka plan trials um, for patients with generalized myasthenia gravis. And this is just um, a page showing the conflicts of interest of my fellow authors. And um, as many of you know, um, Zalucaplan is a complement C5 inhibitor, and it's shown significant myasthenia gravis specific improvements in patients who are antibody positive, ACHR, generalized myasthenia gravis, in both phase two and phase three randomized controlled trials. And uh, in interim analysis of subjects in RAISE XT in the ongoing open label study, um, there's been demonstration that Zalucaplan is both efficacious and very well tolerated um, in the long term. And in further long term data from RAISE XT, we're hoping to enhance our understanding of both the safety and efficacy of Zalucaplan. And in this particular presentation, what I'll be talking about um, is the assessment of long-term outcomes and characteristics of patients, both MGADL and um, QMG, who showed response in the first week of um, administration of the drug. 
And so what we did was um, we only looked at subjects who had received study, the actual study drug in both um, the phase two and phase three trials. And this is where I can't see the screen either. Um, we had a total of 93 subjects from both phase two and phase three who had received the top dose of 0.3 milligrams per kilogram throughout the two trials and then extending into the open label. Um, and um, this was a post hoc evaluation of these subjects, looking at them from the very beginning, going through the whole 60 weeks that we have data at this point. Um, and so, as you know from previous presentations, um, at week 12, there's a significantly more, more patients who've received Zalucoplan than placebo who are clear responders. But importantly, importantly, what you can see is for MGADL, in the first week, there's um, at almost 40% of subjects responded. And then if you look at the MGC, or the MG, um, the QMG, you can see that roughly 35% of subjects were also responders in that first week. So for MGADL, they needed to have a three-point improvement, and for the QMG, they needed to have a greater than five-point improvement. And the other thing that's important is that the medium time to improvement was two weeks, and it was significantly faster in Zalucoplan patients than in placebo patients. And, and so then what was done was we then looked at the subjects through the whole study. And what's really important about this was that their response, those people who responded in the first week, 80, greater than 80% of them had a continued response to their MGADL at week 60. And um, about 85% of the patients had a continued response in their QMG in that whole time. So um, what's also very important here is that if you look at the demographics of these subjects and their baseline disease, there was essentially no difference in the early responders, the one-week responders, compared to the overall group of people um, in who had received Zalucoplan throughout the whole time. And this, this data here is for ADL, but if you also looked at the QMG, it's very similar. Um, as I mentioned, um, this has proven to be a very safe drug, and this is just uh, a listing of the overall treatment um, associated adverse events. Um, there were approximately 32% of patients had a serious TAEA, and of those patients, um, 15 or 8% had a worsening of their myasthenia, and 2% had uh, COVID pneumonia. So in summary, um, MGADL and QMG responders at week one had been demonstrated to remain responders, almost 90% of them, in the entire 60 weeks of the trial. Um, the week one responders, um, there was a response rate of almost 80% for MGADL and 85% for QMG throughout the entire study. Um, importantly, there were no significant differences between the group of, of patients who responded at week one and the other patients who responded throughout the study. Um, we know that Zalucoplan has a very good safety profile and is well tolerated, and um, it's, it's sustained. The response is sustained over the 60 weeks, which I think is a re really dramatic thing for um, this drug and, and the treatment of our patients. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation, and I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Nowak at this point. Thank you. I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for inviting uh, us for a presentation. So I'm going to be presenting on behalf of my authors, co-authors. I want to stress the title, Antigen-Specific Immune Therapy for the Treatment of Generalized Myasthenia Gravis, 
So what I want you to leave here with from this presentation is antigen-specific immune therapy. Um, I'll present the rationale and design for the first in human randomized control trial. These are my disclosures. Um, I'd like to point out that uh, the clinical development in the trial is sponsored by Core Pharmaceuticals. So uh, getting into um, the concept of what, what it is that we're doing and what is the investigational product that uh, we're looking to explore. So Core Nanoparticles are a proprietary safe and tolerable polymer platform that allows delivery of encapsulated antigens. The platform is versatile and can be used as a preventative and therapeutic intervention. There's evidence already in support of its use in autoimmune diseases, specifically celiac and primary uh, biliary sclerosis. So, sorry. So how can this be applied to myasthenia gravis? So CNP-106 is a nanoparticle encapsulating seven acetylcholine receptor peptides. All of the reported receptor epitopes of mutants have been included. And this is a safe, intravenously administered um, intervention. So how can this be translated into uh, treatment for myasthenia gravis? So like I pointed out, um, that this is antigen-specific therapy. What we understand about myasthenia gravis is that this is a T-cell dependent, mm -hmm. B-cell mediated autoimmune disease via IgG or uh, autoantibodies that are IgGs. So what we're attempting to do is immune reprogramming driven by T-cell dependent mechanisms. And our hypothesis is that CNP-106 will lead to antigen-specific inactivation of T-cells that are driving disease pathology. The general idea here is that uh, there will be tolerogenic signals that lead to downregulation of disease-specific B cell responses in an effort to essentially reduce autoantibody production and in an effort to actually improve clinical outcomes for patients, but looking at it super upstream from the T cell perspective. So this is a planned one phase 1b2a a placebo controlled clinical trial that is primarily looking to understand safety and tolerability in a myasthenia gravis cohort so our goal here is to really do a slight shift in our approach to treating patients for a long time we've utilized non-specific immunosuppressive therapies but in the modern era we have very direct to therapy approaches T-cells are not something that have been really targeted at all by some of the modern therapies that are currently FDA approved. So our goal here is to try to induce a state of tolerance for patients with autoimmune disease, specifically autoimmune myasthenia gravis. So as I pointed out, this is a placebo-controlled clinical trial that is of um, duration of, I can't read that either, but let me just flip to my notes here. I apologize for that. 730 days with uh, uh, readouts at various stages throughout that period of time. So there is initial dosing of CNP-106 at the beginning of the clinical trial. And then subsequent um, time points are really to understand what happens to the immune system, what happens to clinical outcomes over time, and also to understand really the safety in patients um, after um, a, a period of time after exposure to uh, CNP-106. Uh, many of the exploratory outcome measures are typical for an MG clinical trial, things like MG-ADL, QMG, MG composite, and quality of life. There will also be an effort to collect healthcare uh, utilization data and also looking at potential immune markers uh, to help inform a future uh, clinical trial design with the use of CNP-106. So the study framework, as I noted, this is a phase 1b2a. So the intended uh, population that will be enrolled are those with acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis, MGFA class 2 to 4, so very typical. Um, there is an escalation phase uh, that will uh, look to enroll approximately 18 patients. And there are three defined cohorts uh, at 150 milligrams as the low dose. Uh, 350 milligrams as sort of the medium dose, and then depending on the safety data, the data monitoring committee will define and select a dose, which most likely will be a slightly higher dose uh, for cohort three. Based on those data, 
there is an expansion phase where there will be an enrollment of approximately 36 additional patients into the various expansion cohorts uh, against placebo. So very typical inclusion criteria, as I noted before, generalized acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients, age range between 18 and 75 with an ADL score of six or higher and a QMG score of 11 or higher. Um, there are some key exclusion criteria, things like thymectomy within 12 months, things like use of uh, FCRN inhibitors or C5 complement inhibitors, very standard for an interventional clinical trial that is looking to uh, study a new uh, treatment modality. So where are we now? So uh, the study and the protocol has gone through FDA review and approval. Uh, study sites are in the process of being contracted and soon to be open for enrollment. I was hoping to announce that we had our first site open for enrollment already at this time, but not yet. But our plan and we're uh, projected to have first site enrolled by the end of the year. So here's some very brief uh, study contact information. And um, I'll close and I'll hand it over to Dr. Vu. Happy to take questions during the Q&A. Thanks very much for your attention. Um, I would like to thank the MGFA for the opportunity to present to you the interim analysis of, uh, on quality of life, efficacy, uh, tolerability, and long-term safety in participants uh, with generalized mycine gravis who receive subcutaneous epigraphitigamide in the ADAPT uh, SC extension study. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, and, I'm sorry. So the mechanism of action of, of um, Evgatigamod was uh, covered by Dr. Uh, Howard earlier, so I'm going to skip over that. And just to say that uh, Evgatigamod, uh, SC is a co-formulation of uh, Evgatigamod and recombinant uh, human hyaluronidase, uh, which allows for rapid uh, administration of a larger volume. Um, PK and PD modeling, along with uh, the ADAPT phase three data suggests that uh, four-week uh, administration of 10 milligram of Fgotigamod sub-Q uh, and 10 milligram of, uh, per kilogram of IV uh, Fgotigamod result in compatible uh, decrease in IgG level. And here is the uh, design of the study. So the ADAPT SC uh, was a 10-week study um, where the patients would get uh, weekly dosing for four weeks, and then was observed for uh, seven more weeks. And um, the comparison was between uh, sub-Q and IV. Uh, these patients were then transitioned to the uh, sub-Q extension portion of the study. Um, the patients from the ADAPT IV study were also uh, transitioned into this uh, study. So we have 184 patients who entered the study. And uh, during this uh, uh, open label extension, uh, they would get uh, four uh, injections, uh, weekly injections, and then follow uh, after that. And unlike the ADAPT study where they have to reach a certain baseline level uh, of uh, ADL to get retreatment, the decision to retreat was uh, left up to the PI, uh, a situation that's more reflective of what we see in clinical practice. Uh, here is the demographic um, of the patients. On the left side is the uh, whole population. The middle column represent the uh, ACHR positive patients, and the right side represent the ACHR negative patients. Uh, I will concentrate on the ACHR positive patient today, and uh, the data on the uh, ACHR antibody negative patient will be presented uh, at poster 151 by Dr. Howard uh, uh, later on this week. And uh, you can see that, uh, you know, it's fairly, the, the, the data is fairly typical of what you see in, in clinical trials. Um, more women uh, involved. Uh, for this particular study, uh, the ADL score was 7.6, the QOL15R was uh, 13, and the 
uh, EQ, 5D, 5L, uh, VAS was uh, 61. Uh, in terms of concomitant medications, the uh, list are listed there, and it's uh, pretty typical what's going on uh, in the world of MG. Uh, I just want to point to the fact that 16% of the patients were on um, period of stigmine only, uh, suggesting that this uh, medication can be used uh, as a monotherapy. Uh, in terms of uh, AE, 85% um, of the patient experience uh, at least one AE. However, only 20% experienced in a, a more severe AE defined as having a grade uh, three or higher. 18% uh, of the patient had SAE. Uh, injection site reaction was seen in 46%, and I will discuss that further later on the next slide. 50% uh, of the patient had an infection, and four deaths were reported. None of them were considered related to treatment uh, by the PI. In terms of the most common uh, AE, uh, infection site erythema was the most common, followed by uh, COVID-19, headaches, nasopharyngitis, diarrhea, injection site, pain, itching, and bruising. So in terms of injection site uh, reaction, uh, during the first cycle, 35% of the patient had uh, reported that, but as you can see here, uh, that incident decreased over time to about 15.5 by the time they reached the uh, sixth uh, cycle. In terms of uh, MSE, uh, about 40% of the patients reached that point uh, during their cycle, and in terms of uh, clinically meaningful improvement, defined as a decrease of two or more points in the MGADL at week four, roughly 80% of the patients reached that status. In terms of mean change in uh, MGADL, and, and to remind you, uh, they don't have to go back to baseline score to get the next treatment, so that why you see on the uh, week zero, um, the, the starting point for each cycle is a bit different. Uh, and then on, in the table on the right side there, that's the mean difference from the very beginning of the study from baseline. But uh, the patients uh, had about two or three points improvement uh, from the cycle baseline. Uh, similarly, for the QOL 15R, uh, again, they start at different points, but they consistently uh, had improvement um, at week uh, four uh, to the tune of uh, two to four points from uh, the cycle baseline and, and roughly five to six points from the, the study baseline. In terms of uh, overall health, as determined by the EQ scale, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the mean uh, improvement was uh, between uh, 12 points and 16 points um, at uh, week four. Uh, so in summary, uh, FGOT to get mod sub-Q was well tolerated with no new safety uh, signals observed compared to the uh, ADAPT uh, sub-Q study. All infusion site reaction uh, was mild to moderate, decreased with subsequent cycles, and did not lead to any treatment discontinuation. Uh, Evgatigamat sub-Q treatment uh, resulted in consistent and repeatable improvements in uh, ADL, QOL15, and EQ total score over multiple cycles, with improvements uh, noted as early as the first week uh, after uh, starting the cycle. Uh, the majority of the participants experienced uh, clinically meaningful improvement and a subset was able to achieve uh, MSE. Uh, the proportions of uh, uh, participants who achieved these statuses uh, remain consistent across uh, multiple cycles. Uh, so the data uh, was collected over about a year. Uh, the study is later for three years, so we will have more data coming on. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Sure, I have one for um, Dr. Nowak. For the, um, the trial design, I was wondering if duration of disease um, plays a role in your expected response to the nanoparticle therapy, because I didn't see it in the inclusion or exclusion criteria. No, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we believe that the 
enrollment in the study, like with, with many interventional trials, will be challenging, so there is no restriction on duration of disease except that they have to have active disease. The larger question is whether or not that might have an impact on a uh, potential clinical benefit. Um, and that's unclear. Um, we do believe that um, T cell dependent drivers don't go away um, as uh, the duration of disease progresses over time. Now, but that said, I don't think anyone has a clear answer to that. And again, it's a safety and tolerability study from which I think we can learn uh, about that um, and whether or not there's any difference in signals between uh, different uh, disease durations. So I have a question for Dr. Brill and Dr. Wu. So could you elaborate on any differences in female and male patients on the clinical responses in MGADL or QMG? Did you see any, any sex-related changes? Um, I think we've, uh, all studies, uh, phase three studies actually did that analysis and none of them actually show any gender differences uh, in terms of response. And in the beginning, did they have similar uh, clinical scores? I don't recall a difference, but uh, I don't think so. Anyone else has any comments? No? I agree with Dr. Vu. The only difference would be the proportion of women is a little different in different studies. Sometimes it's 50-50, sometimes it's a little more women than men. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Small from Pittsburgh. Um, question for Dr. Vu and perhaps any of the speakers in general. Some of the um, medications included in uh, Dr. Vu's study if I'm not mistaken, many of them were mestinone alone without corticosteroids. Am I incorrect in that? If I'm incorrect in that, I apologize. Um, I think you're correct. Uh, if you look at the data across all studies, there's roughly about 10% um, that were not on anything else except uh, periodostigmine. Because that's, 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 that's quite an um, accomplishment. Uh, the general trend for general neurologists in the community is mestinone and then um, prednisone gets thrown at things frequently at 40 or 50 milligrams a day and trouble has started. And um, I would like to think that uh, steroid reduction uh, or steroid elimination, I, I think I talked to Dr. Vu last year about this, would be a goal as well. Certainly it's wonderful if um, the Hytrulo and the other uh, meds work, but if there's any data on ability to reduce steroids, that would uh, certainly be of interest to all of us to decrease morbidity, morbidity and mortality. That's the big bugaboo, at least in my practice, of hundreds of myasthenics um, that come to us on too many steroids. Uh, I guess it's a statement and a question in general, but congratulations on being able to include generalized patients who are just on Mestinon. I think that's a unique thing, perhaps not at the academic centers, but certainly out in the community. Thank you. Thanks, George. Um, I think uh, the data on, on steroid tapering has been uh, analyzed and collected, have been collected and certainly analyzed, and so more of that uh, data will be coming out. Uh, I think the bigger issue is what to do with the non-steroid immunosuppressants that take a lot longer because people tend to stop the steroid before the IST. So, um, you know, th those data is uh, uh, ongoing and being collected, so we hope to have an answer soon. Question is for uh, Dr. Freimer. Go Bucks. we were number one. You're number one. <laughs> Tony, you're but, doing but, a better but, job keeping track than me. But the harder question, what intrigued me was um, the figure that you did with the um, 12 month and then con or 12 weeks and continuing and you showed yes after first you had an improvement um, in the drug treated after the first week and went through 12 and either there was even a continued decline and it looked like it natured around 12 weeks but what intrigued me was once you went into open label at 12 weeks there was a dramatic decline 
within a two-week period, uh, or they, get, they improved the same magnitude which it took during the blinded 14 weeks or 12 weeks in only two weeks. Once they were open, the placebo patients got the drug, they got the same magnitude of change that it took in the open label for the drug. And what does that tell you? Uh, it tell us placebo response or what's going I on here? I think it's probably a combination. Um, you know, most subjects in the placebo portion of the study also improved a little bit, obviously not as much as the patients on real drug. So there is placebo, but I think, and Chip and I were talking about this earlier, that we had some patients who I now know were on placebo who got drug and the same day went home and, and ate that they hadn't eaten things that they hadn't in a while. So how do you explain that? I don't think we know entirely the science of it. They, know, they didn't know they were on placebo. They had gotten a little better, and then they get the real drug and improve dramatically. So there's probably some placebo, but there's probably a significant drug effect there. It's, it's pretty dramatic. Thank you so much to all the presenters. We have to move on with the set next section. Thank you. All right, we will now be moving on to the last session of the day. We'll be hearing on a variety of topics related to general practice, and we'll have the speakers come on stage. We will start by hearing from Renee Willman of Alera Health, who will be giving us updates on MGFA Global MG Patient Registry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking the MGFA for inviting this presentation and for everyone uh, for attending the session. Um, my presentation this afternoon is really going to give an update on the MGFA registry. Many of you may be aware of the registry or have worked with its data in the past. Um, however, we have some exciting new developments with respect to the registry um, and the growing partnership that the MGFA um, has initiated with Alira Health. Um, so to give you some context on that, um, as everyone should be very well familiar with the MGFA and their mission, um, Alira Health was selected as a partner for the registry uh, through a competitive RFP process. Um, and our services and capabilities are really supportive of the registry in two ways. One is the exclusive research partner to facilitate access to the data and its analysis, and also the use of our technology health storylines, which is a digital platform that allows patients to participate in the registry through a mobile application as well as through a web portal, which offers several expanded capabilities relative to the former solution of the registry, which was um, through an online academic portal. Um, to give you a bit of an overview of the registry itself, um, the registry really characterizes the natural history of disease and its impact on patients. The data is patient reported and patients can participate um, regardless of whether they are being treated at an academic or a community institution. Um, any patient is able to join and contribute their data. It is the largest um, patient registry of patients with MG. We have um, over 3,500 patients who are enrolled since the beginning of the registry in 2013, and it is continuing to grow through a, a variety of engagement efforts. Um, in terms of the data that is contained within the registry, we have, in addition to demographics, patient-reported outcomes, um, clinical and treatment characteristics, and other healthcare resource use data that is collected through an open enrollment questionnaire as well as twice-a-year follow-up surveys. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about one of the advantages of the new platform and how this is opening access and capability to access um, additional data from patients in real world and real time contexts. So in terms of who this data can benefit, um, it's accessible to researchers, um, both academics as well as industry researchers, and um, on HUR, real world evidence or medical affairs teams. 
For research and development teams, we can also support patient recruitment um, all the way up to a full service CRO capability by um, interacting with the community of patients that are participating in the registry. And the ability to share information through the platform also creates opportunities to offer access to patient education, um, to promote different activities within the registry tool, as well as generating patient insights, accessing individual patients to contribute to patient panels, interviews, um, or ad boards. So the registry really is now opening up the ability to learn from this patient community across the entire life cycle of discovery. Um, this is a brief snapshot of some of the data that describes the patient population who participated in the registry. And again, this is a cumulative look at the patients who have participated in the registry since 2013. Um, so we do have quite broad representation across the US. And increasingly, we are able to allow patients from additional countries globally to participate in the registry. Um, the GFA is also pursuing um, collaboration and the ability for the registry to be promoted more widely globally. Um, the participants are mostly white, but we do have some diversity. And this is, again, being addressed through our ongoing engagement and recruitment um, in collaboration with the MGFA and their other programs um, to increase representation in the registry. And similar to some of the other patient cohorts that we've seen characterized today, um, there are slightly more females and males participating. We can see that there's quite a breadth of patient ages. Of course, these are all adults who are participating in the survey at this time. Um, and we capture not only age at enrollment in the questionnaire and as they continue to participate in follow-up surveys, but also their age at diagnosis. So there are a number of research questions that can be addressed um, relating to uh, when patients are diagnosed and how their experience changes over time as they learn to manage their MG and as their symptom profile changes. Um, the two primary methods that this registry collects data is through an enrollment questionnaire followed by standardized surveys every six months. And this has traditionally since 2013 until last year been the mode of data collection. Um, so we have longitudinal data since that time. The number of patients that have completed multiple follow-up assessments does vary as it's open-ended. However, we now also have the ability for patients to interact with a variety of health tools within the Health Storylines app. And this can also be complemented with specific surveys. So things like patient preferences, studies, um, other types of short surveys to address acute research questions can be fielded within the app to provide all of these opportunities to collaborate and research in a single digital environment that patients become familiar with as they use it. The additional data such as symptom reporting, daily moods, characterizing notes in their journals offers us insight into things like exacerbation um, or myasthenic crisis as they happen in real time. So patients now not, don't necessarily have to wait until their next follow-up survey to be able to report on some of these events, but as they're navigating it, can use this as a tool to document their experience for the purpose of research, but also to use this as a tool in their interaction with their own care team and can share this data with their physicians, um, which hopefully for those of you um, practicing will find useful as you're able to discuss um, the changes that your patients may have gone through since their last clinical visit. In terms of the future of the registry and how we're working together to bring these changes forward, um, there is an oversight committee, the registry's advisory council that is overseen by the MGFA. And it has participants from multiple stakeholder groups, ranging from patients themselves to providers, industry sponsors, researchers, and of course stakeholders and staff from the MGFA. Um, we are working on a project to review the registry questionnaire and make sure that it is as relevant as possible from the perspective of all the wonderful changes and movement that um, we know is happening in this space and to optimize the value of the data both for researchers and for the patients who are contributing on an ongoing basis and also making sure that the length, duration, phrasing of the questionnaire all makes sense and is accessible from a patient perspective. We're also really focusing on offering additional opportunities for patients to participate in research through the registry. In addition to the core questionnaires that form the basis of the registry, we are able to share communications to patients about clinical research opportunities, which can support recruitment efforts of the clinical trials that are ongoing. And we can also administer independent surveys and studies that patients can opt into within the platform um, and perform all the activities up to and including compensation of patients for their time for participating in these studies directly within the platform. 
So patients can participate by going to the registry landing page, mgregistry.org, and you'll see an example on the screen there of what they will see to either participate on the desktop computer, on the web, or by downloading the Health Storylines application. And for all of the providers in the room, we would love if you would encourage your patients who inter that you interact with to enroll in the registry. Of course, over time, the more data we can collect from patients who are newly diagnosed and follow them longitudinally with all of the new drugs that are coming to market and the treatments um, and real-world patterns of care that we're all trying to better understand, um, both new patients' enrollment and an ongoing participation will be important. Um, if you have a chance to stop by the MG table on your way out at the conclusion of today's session, there are some postcards that have a uh, QR code um, and some additional information about research opportunities with the MGFA that I would encourage you to grab, if not um, at least take a picture of that QR code so you can access this website um, easily in the future. There, it's also linked directly from the MGFA webpage. Um, and of course, there is research that is ongoing uh, related to the registry as has been conducted since its inception um, in 2013. Um, Angela Ting has a poster that was presented in the session earlier today. Um, so if you didn't have a chance to see it, you can certainly follow up with us to learn more about some of the studies that are leveraging the registry um, and how it can be leveraged both as a tool to contribute to your research and also how to assist your patients in enrolling. Thank you so much. So I'm going to talk about a study that we did looking at the national trends in the utilization of thymectomy for myasthenia gravis. We report no relevant disclosures. So as you all know, thymectomy has been a well, long-standing and well-established treatment for non-thymomonous myasthenia gravis, but it wasn't until 2016 with the publication of the MGTX trial that there emerged conclusive evidence that the transdermal approach improves patient outcomes. Since 2016, there has been no population-based studies looking at thymectomy trends in myasthenia. So we had two objectives. The first was to look to see if thymectomy trends increased over time, and the second was to assess what disparities, if any, exist in utilization. We utilized the National Inpatient Sample Database from 2012 through 2019, which contains over 7 million hospitalizations and represents 20% of all discharges from non-federal acute care hospitals in the United States. By using a survey-weighted statistical software, we were able to extrapolate data from our sample to um, account for all national trends in hospital admissions. We included patients over the age of 18 with a diagnosis of myasthenia and excluded those with a diagnosis of thymoma. We had two primary outcomes. The first was to look at trends in thymectomy, analyzed by using a joint point regression model to look at thymectomy rates and changes over time. And the second was to assist predictors of thymectomy utilization to assess disparities looking at a multivariable regression model, which took into account demographic, patient, and hospital level factors as, as seen here. Our study population included 218,000 patients with myasthenia gravis hospitalized from 2012 through 2019, and we excluded around 5,900 5, patients due to age and thymoma diagnosis. 2% of that remaining population underwent thymectomy, with 57% undergoing the transsternal approach and 43% undergoing the minimally evasive approaches. So we found that thymectomy trends did increase over time. From 2012 to 2014, this was a more modest increase. But from 2015 onward, the number of thymectomies increased dramatically, including the transsternal and minimally invasive approaches. What's more important, though, is that this increase was nonlinear, making the annual percent change of 69.8% less informative. What is arguably more interesting is that when we used a time indicator variable, we found that thymectomy increased more in 2017 through 2019 after the publication of the MGTX trial compared to 2012 through 2016. Next, I'm going to show our multivariable um, regression um, analyses with our key findings on the right. Um, highlighted in gray will be factors that decreased thymectomy utilization, and highlighted in blue will be factors that increased thymectomy utilization. So in terms of demographic factors, we found that older age, black race, and female gender had lower likelihood of thymectomy utilization, as highlighted in gray on the right, or left. 
Um, in terms of patient level factors, we found that there was a higher likelihood of Medicaid, private, and no charge other insurance compared to Medicare. And we found no change in median household income by quartiles. And lastly, we found that with higher Alex-Hauser comorbidity index scores, there were low, lower likelihood of thymectomy utilization. And lastly, with hospital level factors, we found that there was a higher likelihood in medium and large hospital size compared to small, and urban teaching hospitals compared to rural. There was no change based on hospital location. So in summary, we found that thymectomy has increased over time, which may suggest that the MGTX trial was practice changing. While the MGTX trial only used transdermal approaches, our studies highlight that more minimally invasive techniques are now being employed. However, it is also important to recognize that we found disparities with the utilization with female and black patients being less likely to undergo thymectomy. Unfortunately, this trend has been seen across other surgical procedures, subspecialties, and non-surgical care. And lastly, patient level factors, older age, and higher level comorbidity index were associated with lower thymectomy utilization which may again reflect the MGTX study population which had younger cohort and excluded those with higher medical comorbidities while also acknowledging that older age, um, greater than 50, there's less clear-cut data that thymectomy has benefit. There were several limitations to our study um, due to mostly uncontrolled and potentially confounding variables that, were, um, that we did not have in our data set. This includes acetylcholine antibody subtype, ocular versus generalized disease, duration of disease, treatment regimen, severity of disease, and patient preferences. These factors are going to be important to consider um, in future studies that are looking at thymectomy trends. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Ayer. Hi, uh, thank you to the uh, MGFA for, for allowing us to present some additional work um, on our side effect projects in myasthenia gravis. Um, I'm just gonna open by saying that it is such an exciting time to be taking care of patients with myasthenia, just kind of looking around the room and seeing all the new treatment options that we have. For our patients, it's, it's exciting. Um, it's also overwhelming um, and um, I think what we need to work through as a, as a community is we need to start to think about how we're gonna distinguish among all these amazing new therapies that we have, and also compare them to the ones that we already had before some of these other therapies were developed. So when I think about comparing treatments, um, this is one, one way I think about it, is, is determining treatment value. So on the, the top part of the equation, we have clinical benefit and quality of life. And on the bottom part of the equation, we have cost, we have side effects, and we have treatment burden. And I'm gonna focus in on, on side effects today. Um, we did a survey uh, a number of years ago, and sort of right after um, patient and physician's concerns about clinical benefit from the treatments that we give to patients, the very next thing that was considered to be most important by these groups was the side effect burden of the treatments that we are giving. In fact, um, the MGNET Rare Disease Clinical Research Network um, just published a paper last year where they identified developing ways to measure side effect burden as a critical need of the, the myasthenia gravis community. So we've been working um, for a number of years on, on, on a way to try and do that. Um, and this unit that we've developed is called the Adverse Event Unit, the AEU. Um, this is a patient and physician weighted consensus unit to measure the burden of side effects among any medications across any conditions in neurological um, disorders. So this is not specific to myasthenia, um, but I think particularly applicable in myasthenia. And this system was designed to assign weight to different um, side effect categories. It's an interactive system. Whoops where um, you can click a medicine that a patient's taking, you're given a list of potential side effects, and you can score your patient's um, side effects at a clinical visit or at a, um, a research visit. Um, we, we did a single center validation study at University of Vermont where we showed that um, the AEU scores incompletely correlated with measures of quality of life, and that the score goes up 
with the number of medications that a person is taking, as one might expect. So today, I'm going to show you some data. Um, the, the team from the MGTX thymectomy trial was, provided us with um, data where we were able to code um, the side effect burden experienced by patients in this study. So the MGTX trial had 117 patients. All of the patients in the trial received prednisone. Uh, at 12 months, you could have azathioprine added to your treatment regimen if you were not doing well. Um, and because they collected data in such a good way, we were able to code um, AEU scores. We did not consider MG exacerbation as a uh, side effect, because uh, that's disease worsening, not a side effect. Um, so what we found was kind of interesting. So this is prednisone area under the disease curve here. This is M uh, AEU total score here. And you can see that the score, in, uh, uh, side effect score goes up to a point and then it starts to come down. So it sort of performed as we would expect, where higher doses of prednisone were associated with higher doses of side effects, um, except in this cohort here, where patients were receiving very high doses of steroids and not developing side effects. And it's interesting, because we looked at that cohort, um, and we think these are the same patients who were receiving high doses of steroids, because in the trial, steroid dose was increased um, based on how you were doing, and if you were doing poorly, so this is the QMG score, these same people who were having low doses, low side effects were also not responding to prednisone, suggesting that maybe there's something about those patients, um, and there's work to be done. Maybe there's metabolomic reasons for this. Um, the next thing we looked at was whether or not it mattered if a patient was receiving prednisone or prednisone and azathioprine, and what we found was is that side effect burden was much higher in patients who were receiving both things. So I think it's time as a community that we stop talking about prednisone as the only thing that causes side effects for our patients. Every meeting we go to, that's the focus, but I think that is the tip of the iceberg. I think we need to think about what these other things are doing, um, and I think this is a reflection of that. Um, in addition, we found some other interesting things as well. So AEU score went up with age, probably reflecting that our, our older patients may have other medical comorbidities. Um, and then interestingly, I think we have to do some work to understand this um, finding in the MGTX data. So female patients were more likely to report side effects in that trial, however, Male patients, when they did report side effects, seemed to have higher levels of side effect burden. So it's a little unclear what that means. If there is, um, you know, if sex does play a role um, in expression of side effects, but there's some early data to suggest that maybe it might play a role. So in summary, um, I think what we learned by doing this um, project is that we can assign AEU scores retrospectively if studies collect data in a very detailed way as it was done in the MGTX trial. Um, we find that the score tends to go up with more treatments for myasthenia and higher age. I think prednisone is not the sole driver of side effect burden and I think there's a lot more work to understand the comparative burden of side effects among the treatments we have for myasthenia. So thank you for your attention. It is winter. Come visit us in Vermont. It's almost ski season. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Julia Greenberg, and I'm a third year resident at NYU, so bear with me. Um, but I'm going to be talking a little bit about our research on global variation in practice, um, practices surrounding myasthenia, and how these practices align or do not align with the international consensus guidelines. Let's see. Uh, so as all of you probably know, the 2016 and 2020 international consensus guidelines for management of myasthenia were created in an effort to address lack of standardization surrounding treatment of the disease. But whether these efforts has, have been successful remains uncertain. And so to address this question, we sought the opinions of practicing neurologists around the world 
um, with regard to management of myasthenia, how their practices align or do not align with the consensus guidelines, and whether there are uh, regional trends in, um, in differences in practice. So we created a case-based survey through Neurology's practice current section um, with questions surrounding various aspects of myasthenia management. We collected data from a total of 318 survey respondents across six continents, all except Antarctica, and 65 countries. And here are some of the results. I'll preface by saying that I don't have time to go through all of the cases in detail. Um, of course, if anybody's interested, we're happy to you know, give you guys a full handout with all of the cases. Um, but one of them involved a young woman with acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia. And respondents were asked uh, a series of questions um, regarding management. And so, you know, the vast majority um, recommended pyridostigmine as initial treatment for this patient in accordance with the guidelines. And most would add prednisone as initial immunosuppressant therapy if the patient had an unsatisfactory response to pyridostigmine alone. Again, in agreement with consensus guidelines. However, um, you can see here that there was a lot of uncertainty regarding the role of thymectomy um, in this patient with non-thymomatous acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenia, with only 54% of respondents recommending referral for thymectomy. Notably, 19% of respondents actually indicated that they did not have access to thymectomy in their current practice environment. Um, with most of these being practitioners outside of North America and um, Europe. Now, as you'll see with the cases that come um, as we go along as well, we still have to clarify how much of this variation is due to differences in knowledge base versus differences in resource and, um, and cost of therapeutics. There is also a lot of variation um, with regard to both initial diagnostic approach and uh, treatment of musk myasthenia. Again, I don't have time to go through all of the details of, um, of this case or the variability we got in terms of um, approach to diagnosis, diagnosis, which varied a lot. Uh, but I did want to highlight that only 27% of respondents recommended rituximab as um, a, um, an early therapeutic option in someone with musk myasthenia who failed to respond to initial immunosuppressant therapy with prednisone, um, despite guidelines um, clearly stating that this should be considered as an early option in someone who fails to respond appropriately to prednisone. Again, we did not explicitly ask about this, but it's likely that access and cost to rituximab limit its availability in various practice settings. And then the last case I wanted to highlight is one of a young woman of childbearing age again with generalized acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia, stable on mycophenolate and pyridostigmine. And respondents were again asked a series of questions regarding um, management um, during pregnancy and also preconception counseling. And respondents unanimously recommended stopping or decreasing the dose of mycophenolate in general agreement with the consensus guidelines, which state that mycophenolate is contraindicated in pregnancy due to its teratogenicity. Uh, the vast majority also recommended continuing pyridostigmine in some form, again in agreement with consensus guidelines, which um, recommend pyridostigmine as first-line treatment during pregnancy. There was great variation, however, among respondents um, in terms of whether they felt an additional agent should be added uh, rather than mycophenolate, uh, despite guidelines that currently say that prednisone should be considered as the first-line immunosuppression agent um, during pregnancy. There was also uh, a lot of variation um, and uncertainty in terms of uh, what participants recommended as the optimal mode of delivery, with only 25% recommending vaginal delivery. And that's uh, despite, again, guidelines that clearly state that vaginal delivery should be the objective and actively encouraged. So in summary, uh, despite the fact that respondents agreed on very basic uh, aspects of management for generalized myasthenia, um, differences in clinical presentation, um, in response to treatment, and clinical comorbidities all led to discrepancies among responses and discordance, um, deviation from the consensus guidelines. Um, so 
basically, despite the effort to create a set of international consensus guidelines for management of myasthenia, our preliminary survey data suggests that there still remains a lot of uncertainty in the neurology community regarding various aspects of my myasthenia, including the role of thymectomy, the management of musk myasthenia, and um, preconception counseling and management of myasthenia during pregnancy. And so in the future, we hope to conduct further analysis on the data to better elucidate how these trends are driven by differences in knowledge base and dissemination of the guidelines versus differences in um, resource availability. Um, thank you. And now we will welcome Dr. Stashik. Okay, now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about near fiber EMG, which is sort of a new way to assess uh, individual fiber contributions to, to Moda units and their stability. Uh, my name is Dan Stashik, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the work and of, of my collaborators to, that help facilitate this. And we don't have any sort of conflict of interest to. Uh, report, and why is this not advancing? Oh, the big green button, oh, okay. All right, so we're gonna talk about what motor unit electrophysiological temporal dispersion is, or I'm gonna talk about that. What is motor unit electrophysiological temporal dispersion variability? These are concepts that you're familiar with, I've just sort of given them a little bit of a different term terminology. And then what is the basis of near fiber EMG? Uh, what is the basics of near fiber EMG? And then throughout the talk, and maybe at the end, there's going to be how does near fiber EMG compare to and contrast from single fiber EMG? So, motor unit electrophysiological temporal dispersion, which is the underlying of motor unit um, uh, complexity. So, we have Varying muscle fiber action potential conduction distances. They start at different spots and they conduct different distances. We have variable conduction velocity, um, uh, vary, varying muscle fiber action potential conduction velocities, and these together co combine to produce varying times at which these muscle fiber action potentials are passing by the axial plane of the electrode which then in turn causes varying times of the motor unit potential peaks. So again, that's everything, should all, everyone here should sort of be familiar with that, but I just wanted to sort of set that down. When we get the ensemble average of these, we're now going to contribute to the dispersion, sorry, thank you, uh, the dispersion of, uh, the temporal dispersion of these muscle fiber action potential uh, contributions. Now, in addition, so that's kind of sort of the mean event for the, for the motor unit is what, disper what dispersion, what the temporal dispersion will it have. Across multiple discharges of a motor unit, we're going to have, sorry, we're going to have varying times of transmission delay. There's going to be different conduction velocities along the axonal, uh, on the, along the axonal twigs or, or in, along the sarcolemma but primarily due to uh, neuromuscular transmission variability, there's going, to be, oh, I'm, there's going to be jitter in each of these, oh dear. Yes, there's going to be uh, jitter in each of these muscle fiber action potentials, which again, with the motor unit potential being the ensemble of some of these, we're going to have jitter in, in the motor unit potential. So again, something that uh, everyone is familiar with. So the basis of near fiber EMG, its main objective is to assess the uh, motor unit electrophysiology temporal dispersion and to assess the motor unit electrophysiological temporal dispersion variability. 
like single fiber EMG, near fiber EMG focuses on the contributions from the near fibers. So the, 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 the basis of near fiber EMG is also that it uses something called a low pass double differentiation filtering to convert the mode unit potentials into near fiber mode unit potentials. A low pass double differentiation filter is a narrow bandwidth bandpass filter that has a bandwidth of approximately 1,000 to 3,000 hertz, whereas single fiber EMG uses a more broadband Butterworth bandpass filter, which goes from 5 to 10 or 1,000 to, to 5 or, or 10,000, depending on, on uh, what is being, what, what the individual uh, ha has set the machine to be. So here is a raster of muscle fiber potentials, and here is a raster of near fiber uh, MUPS. And this is a near fiber motor unit potential here, and in the background is the motor unit potential, and you can see where the clear peaks of the muscle of the near fiber are associated with the highest rates of slope change uh, in the um, uh, motor unit potential. So the basics of near, near fiber EMG now, it utilizes EMG signals that are collected with standard clinical needles, standard bandwidth, standard needle positioning, uh, standard level of activation. Uh, it processes motor unit potential trains that have been extracted from an interference pattern using DQEMG or any kind of really decomposition extraction s system. And it gets five to 10 MUPS per, per train. And whereas a single fiber EMG gets one train from one position, from one contraction, and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, near fiber EMG characterizes the typical uh, MUP template by duration, near fiber count, and, and dispersion. So here we have the near fiber count is, the, the duration is the orange, which is similar to a MUP duration, and the count are these three symmetrical clear peaks, and the dispersion is the actual time from the first peak uh, to the last peak. Uh, the basics of near fiber also looks at the variability. Uh, single fiber EMG, it looks at fiber pairs, looks at single points on those fiber pairs. Near fiber EMG uses uh, segment uh, jitter. So here is, is an example of a single fiber EMG trace. Here is a, a trace that was extracted from the decomposition or, or from an interference pattern. Here is a near fiber MUP template in the gray, and then, or sorry, the, the MUP template's in gray, and the, the near fiber MUP is in, in um, a blue. And then here is, here, here is a shimmer of them, and here is a raster. And let's focus on this sort of part of, of this now. And think about something called single fiber or, or segment jitter, which is another unique part about it. So segment jitter values are calculated for each point along the, the train. I keep pushing the wrong button here, sorry people. <laughs> and it uh, go, is, is measured across the ensemble, uh, and it is done by successively selecting a, uh, a, 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 a MUP, a near fiber MUP, segmenting it, and then um, having these segments matched to the previous MUP and the, the following MUP, and getting a jitter value. This jitter value is then weighted by how well these were matched and, and summed together. And then we move on to the next uh, segment, make a similar measure forward and backwards, and then we go on to the next segment, and all of the segments of this motor unit potential are then sort of added to the sum. We then go on to look at the next motor unit potential in, in the train, because we're going across all the train, and we then get a total sum, and we divide, we get a total sum of weighted offsets, we get a total sum of, this, of, of these weights, we divide the weights by or the, the weighted sum by, by the sum of weights, and we get our segment jitter. So the, this segment jitter can then be used to look at the average segment jitter ac across these near fiber peaks, which assess sort of individual or small groups of, of muscle fibers, or it can be done across 
the whole motor unit, which gives us sort of electrophysiological uh, variability of, of the whole uh, motor unit. So again, and here in this example, we have the single fiber value. The jitter is, is uh, uh, 15 and uh, 50, 57, and the uh, segment jitter matches very, very well. And, and this is sort of uh, consistent across uh, many of, mo most of the trains. Uh, so how does, so to, 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 so to summarize, how does near-fiber EMG compare uh, or contrast to, sing to single-fiber EMG? It uses low-pass double differentiation, and it uses segment jitter instead of a, a fiber pair jitter. And it also can measure fiber density, but I, but I won't get into that. Now, I, I know I've gone a little bit over time. I apologize for that. Um, and I haven't really presented any results, per se. But if you visit slash revisit poster 19 and poster 20, that uh, will <laughs> uh, show the effective comparison between single fiber EMG potentials and fiber pair jitter and single fiber or segment jitter. And it will also look at using myasthenia gravis as a, a diagnostic uh, standard, sorry, using near fiber EMG as a diagnostic standard for, for myasthenia gravis. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon uh, again. Um, I'd like to uh, discuss uh, a new study that's just enrolling now. It's called MG Nation. Uh, I'd like to discuss the rationale for the study, the aims, and the study design. The study is supported by Janssen, and these are the disclosures of the authors of the abstract. I don't really have to go through an introduction of, to myasthenia gravis to this audience, as most people have said. All of us know the epidemiology of the disorder. Also, some of the new data regarding epidemiology that Dr. Uh, Panga mentioned, including late onset and now even very late onset myasthenia gravis. We know that patients with myasthenia gravis can have ocular disease, and they, some of these have a predilection to generalize. We know the clinical impact of the disorder. On this background, we also know that uh, treatments, all patients really don't respond very well to treatments, and there's something to be gained um, in terms of uh, better outcomes for these patients, hence this great interest and this movement, if you will, to develop all of these fantastic new therapies. But even with the approval of so many therapies that we're using in clinical practice, the role uh, or the, the algorithm of uh, treatment for myasthenia gravis and the role of each of these therapies and the selection of each of these therapies is somewhat challenging. And hence the rationale of this study to look at uh, a group of patients, a cohort of patients who are being treated, and I'll talk about that, in order to try and get some patterns of how these agents are used in practice and how patients, and how patients are selected and how they do. So in summary, really, MG Nation is a prospective, longitudinal, global, and I will not say real world, uh, cohort study uh, that collects uh, patient, healthcare professional, and caregiver reported outcomes in a population of patients with myasthenia gravis who have uncontrolled disease and who, in whom their clinician is planning to initiate uh, some of the novel immunotherapies. Uh, this is uh, an overall look at the study. We plan to recruit 200 patients, each of whom will be followed for, 20, uh, for 24 months or so. Um, since this is an observational cohort, these patients will not have any fixed study visits. They will come in for their studies and for or for their treatments. Uh, I, we anticipate three to six months, but depending on the treatments, that um, interval may be even shorter. Uh, we will collect uh, clinician reported outcomes when the patients come in, and that outcome that will be collected is the MGADL. We will collect a host of other patient reported outcomes and a caregiver outcomes at other specified intervals. In addition to routine collection, we'll also have event-driven patient reported outcome collection when patients worsen or new treatments are started. 
So what is the objective of this study? The objective is really to describe the demographics, the disease characteristics, the treatment profile of these patients who are not doing so well on standard therapies in whom they are clinicians are considering the initiation of uh, novel immunotherapies. We want to then look and see what is the use, what is the pattern of utilization of these normal immunotherapies? How are people out there in practice selecting these immunotherapies? And then look at the outcomes uh, of the treatment with these immunotherapies, including eff effectiveness and safety. We also want to describe medical resource utilization in this patient population and describe indirect costs related to patients losing employment, et cetera, and caregiver indirect costs as well. Uh, the inclusion criteria are, as I mentioned, but and these pa patients are all patients with generalized myasthenia gravis. They're all adults. Uh, they uh, have are on stable doses, and there's a definition for stable doses I'm not going to go through, uh, of uh, immunotherapies, and they're not doing so well. Their MG-ADL is six or higher. Uh, and at enrollment, uh, they cannot be on any of the novel immunotherapies. They could have received one of these immunotherapies previously and can still be enrolled, but they cannot be on them on en at enrollment. We'll exclude every, anybody who's in a study at that time or someone who cannot come, uh, uh, we wonder about compliance. Outcome assessments, I spoke about the clinician reported outcome. The patient reported outcomes, uh, the MGADL will be collected via a virtual portal every month, but every quarter we'll collect multiple other uh, patient reported outcomes, uh, including myasthenia gravis quality of life 15 revised. We'll collect uh, the neuroqual for fatigue, uh, and this, as you know, looks at patient reported fatigue and the, uh, and the impact of fatigue on various uh, other factors such as physical, mental, and social uh, health. Uh, we'll uh, collect the EQ, uh, Euroqual, Euro um, uh, uh, looking at the five dimension, five level uh, aspect. We'll collect the work, uh, productivity, and impairment score specific to myasthenia gravis, looking at this impact, indirect impact. We'll collect what is called the treatment uh, a satisfaction questionnaire for medications in myasthenia gravis, and of course the other measures I mentioned. Cl the caregivers will provide us um, uh, some uh, information about uh, work productivity lost, mainly time uh, that is lost from work. We will use retrospective data, so in order to collect data about patients' disease, demographics, treatments, et cetera, we'll collect data 12 months prior to the enrollment and then continue to uh, collect prospective data. And so uh, I think this is an exciting paradigm. Uh, it's a large registry study. Um, but it uh, basically is looking at all comers of the novel immunotherapies, uh, any of the drugs uh, that are approved as of now, and that may be approved in the future as, we, uh, as, it, as the study progresses, in order to inform us about the kinds of patients in clinical practice who are selected by their clinicians for these uh, 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 therapies, how these therapies are started, how these patients are doing at the onset when these the therapies are started or before these therapies are, uh, are being started on multiple levels, including work, and then following to see how these patients do subsequently. As I said, uh, it's just beginning to enroll, so um, thank you very much. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Guido. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this topic. Um, it's also a great privilege to close out the session for what's really been a truly remarkable MGFA session. So um, thank you to everyone who's given a talk. <clears throat> um, I know I am standing between you and lunch, um, so I will try to stay on time. Um, but I, I, I hope that this presentation will have um, a, uh, relevance for the clinicians in the room um, with tools that they can use in their practice um, now and then also for uh, pharma who uh, 
might be influenced by how they design clinical trials, um, and also just to see the potential um, synergy of working in a rare disease uh, network like MGH. So hopefully everyone in the room will have um, some interest in this topic. Um, so I'm going to uh, present the results from the Adapting uh, Disease-Specific Outcome Measures pilot trial for telehealth in myasthenia gravis, the ADAPT TeleMG um, study for short. I want to acknowledge that I'm presenting on behalf of a whole study team, and particularly um, the lead co-investigators um, uh, in Maculata Aban, Vern Jewell, um, Henry Kaminsky, um, and Richard Nowak. Um, I have no relevant disclosures to this presentation. As background, MG-specific outcome measures performed remotely are needed to expand care access and to enhance clinical trial readiness. To date, we have limited tools um, which exist for remote or asynchronous measurement of weakness in MG. Um, some of the existing tools are listed below, but they all have limitations um, in scope. The ADAPT TeleMG um, study was, is a MGNet natural history sub-study launched during the COVID-19 pandemic to evaluate virtual visits and MG-specific assessments adapted to the telehealth environment. The study design was a multi-center prospective pilot study within the infrastructure of MGNet, and those are the institutions who participated in the sub-study. The population enrolled were adults fluent in English with stable MG, um, with a severity, MGFA severity class one to four A, followed at a participating MGNet center, and the activities were two to three telemedicine visits performed within seven days of one another. Uh, we're gonna go through the schedule of activities in a bit more detail. Um, there was a screening visit, um, which uh, could occur with the, the first visit one um, or at a separate event. All study visits were performed virtually. Um, at each visit one and visit two, there was an, a, a, the um, study investigator, which in the study was called the observer, in the clinic um, and uh, connected over Zoom to the patient um, and these outcome measures uh, were performed. Specifically, the MG-ADL, the MG-Composite Virtual, the MG-Core Exam were recorded over video so that they could be then sent for a double review by two independent raters asynchronously. To give an example of the MG Composite Virtual, we're all familiar with the MG Composite. It's a validated um, combined subjective and objective outcome measure in MG. Um, the composite virtual had t has 10 items, each within four categories, total score of zero to 50, with higher scores indicating more severe disease. The first seven items were identical to the MG composite. Um, however, we could not assess mild eye closure weakness remotely, and so this was assigned a zero. And the adapted items included neck flexion, which was substituted by single breath count, shoulder abduction strength, which was substituted by a sustained shoulder abduction, and um, similar to the QMG, and hip flexion, which was assessed by sit to stand. Uh, the scales um, were then soar, scored synchronously by the observer, who was right with the patient over Zoom, and the encounter videos sent to be evaluated asynchronously by two to three independent raters. They were sent um, randomly, uh, so the rater did not know whether they were getting visit one or visit two first for review. Um, and they were blinded to the observer and the other independent rater scoring. When um, there were, uh, the, the most concordant pair of independent raters was considered the gold standard for analysis. And the third independent rater, which was called the adjudicator, um, was involved um, if, the, um, if the difference in the scores by the two independent raters exceeded the minimal important difference for that particular scale. The primary outcomes were inter and intra um, rater reliability of the MG composite virtual between visit one and visit two. Um, and just to note that the observer in clinic was then compared to the gold standard, again, which was the most aligned remote rater pair. 
We had, numer we had several secondary outcomes um, for the purposes of time. The secondary outcomes, which I'll uh, talk about today, are the inter and intra-rater reliability of the MG core exam, and then the investigator and patient satisfaction with telehealth. Here were our results. We enrolled 54 patient, uh, 52 rather, patients from five MGNET sites. There was 100% study completion. We had no dropouts. The median age was approximately 63, 50% female, 80, approximately 84% Caucasian. 75% of patients were acetylcholine receptor antibody positive and 19% um, musk antibody positive, so good representation from musk. The mean um, time since MG diagnosis was approximately seven years and the median was four years. And the patients enrolled had a current MGFA severity class of one um, in 38% of cases and class two to three in 61.5%. To give a sense of this population, it was mild to moderately affected with an MGADL score of approximately four um, and an MGQOL15R score of approximately nine. Um, as the patients assessed themselves, 82% felt that they had mild or moderate disease, and the investigator judged um, the patients as having um, mild or moderate disease in 90% of cases. We um, identified uh, the, the number of scales um, that from the patients who were enrolled. Um, we did have some missing data, which led to exclusion of, six, of 17 scales um, because of the data missingness. Um, and then of the included data for the primary outcome, 16% required adjudication by the um, adjudicator. As we can see um, here with the um, uh, intra-rater correlation values of the MG uh, composite virtual between one and two, which is the primary outcome, um, we have very uh, close correlation. So cor perfect correlation is a, is a slope of one. And you can see that this really fits very uh, closely with this with an ICC of 0.91. The correlation was, value was very high of the MG um, uh, composite virtual between the, gold the observer and the gold standard overall. Um, this is a Band Altman plot, which basically looks at the development of bias over time, and there should be a uh, random distribution of the, of the um, difference from zero. Um, and we can see that there may have been a slight learning effect in this case um, from visit one to visit two. We had a high inter-rater reliability, and so when looking at the MG composite virtual, 85%, um, 88% were in agreement when 11.5% disagreed um, based on um, the, the total value. Um, this is the MG um, core exam, and um, the between the uh, observer and the rater, so also highly correlated, but less so. Um, again, MG core exam between visit one and two, highly correlated with an ICC of 0.91. Um, and then finally, at the end of the study, um, the participants and the study observer um, completed the telehealth utility questionnaire. Both the participants and the study observers um, and slash investigators found that this was simple to use. They liked doing it. Um, they felt it would improve access to participate in research and they would use it again for research. However, both parties felt that it was not able to do everything that they wanted and was not the same as an in-person assessment. So um, in terms of final points, the MG composite virtual um, exam, even more than the MG core exam. Um, however, both had a higher intra and intra-rater reliability when performed virtually by a site investigator and uh, the recorded video of the scale was asynchronously interpreted. This was done in a population of computer savvy patients, English speaking and very experienced MG patients and evaluators. So the generalizability to other populations would need to be demonstrated. Um, the adjudication and um, tech issues were significant and really require um, uh, some attention when designing studies. Um, and I think, you know, this, we, we could um, imagine the 16% adjudication rate um, being uh, fairly sta standard. These were stable patients, so the ability to detect change had not been illustrated. 
Um, in conclusion, the ADAPT TeleMG study represents an important step towards developing remote clinical outcomes and enhancing clinical trial readiness and accessibility. The existing data suggests that these monitoring tools can be included in clinical practice um, for an investigator and a population similar to the trial for selected clinical trial visits as an exploratory outcome. It provides data in favor of asynchronous standardization or centralization of MG outcome measures, um, which could be applied to just general um, clinical trial study design to um, enhance the um, reliability of the outcome measures. However, additional uh, tools and technology are needed to be able to improve the evaluation capabilities to match and or enhance in-person assessment by the examiner. So, Thank you very much to all the investigators and also uh, to the raters and adjudicators, Dr. Hara, Ragel, and Rosansky, and all the patients um, who participated. Thank you. Hi. Thank you to our excellent speakers and special kudos to our trainee speakers. We have a few minutes now to take on uh, some questions before we close off the day. Yeah. I have a question about... Um, I, just, oh. uh, I just have a quick comment, Emma, sorry. I'd like to um, congratulate Dr. Greenberg for her presentation. Um, it's always nice when someone goes back and looks at your work and, uh, and sort of gives us feedback. Um, I, I think you got to two very important points there. The, uh, one is the access and the other one is the dissemination and implementation, which is a science in itself. We've done some work on it. Um, in terms of the, um, the access, I'd like to actually clarify one point. One of the um, in the methods, uh, one of the uh, things we decided a priori was that uh, we would not take cost and availability of any drug into consideration. And the reason we did that was because if we took cost and availability into consideration, we had a very uh, heterogeneous population. For instance, um, the Japanese um, guideline uh, panel member, they used rituximab for a, a whole bunch of their acetylcholine receptor antibody positive patients because it's extremely inexpensive, very widely available, where the U.S. didn't and many other countries did not. So it, and so we would not, we would not be able to get any consensus. We would get region-based um, recommendations, which was not the point of this. So we did not, we specifically didn't take cost and availability into consideration. So I just wanted to put that out there. And I think what you mentioned earlier was that you want to sort of go back and look at it. I think to stratify it by availability, and uh, you know, perhaps cost would be useful. Um, and of course, dissemination implementation is a huge part of it. And I think um, uh, actual active dissemination, actual implementation, which are very difficult, and then going back to measure it is an important part of any guideline, which uh, I completely agree. Thank you, by the way, this is great. Question? So the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of American Registry, it was very hard to see the slides. I know you had pie chart. What's the current percentage of non-Hispanic blacks that you have enrolled right now? And uh, do you capture zip code um, incomes? And what are some of the efforts that you guys are um, doing to increase diversity? Thank you for your question. Um, I don't have the exact percentages of on the off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards and show you the slide. Um, we the current um, enrolled patient population are predominantly white patients. However, when you look at this over time, there are also differences. That figure represented the entire patient population who have participated since 2013. Um, in terms of efforts to increase diversity, the new change to the digital enrollment um, and app-based functionality is a way for more, more patients to participate, as well as the way that we're promoting the registry through networks of um, treating physicians. Um, and the MGFA also has several diversity and inclusion efforts to reach 
um, more diverse patients um, who will, of course, be invited to participate in the registry as well. In terms of data around income, employment, um, insurance status, these are all variables that are collected, um, and I'd be happy to chat with anyone afterwards about um, you know, variables and feasibility for studies. Thank you. This will be real quick, but it's for Michael. So um, I agree that as you add on um, additional medications, um, the potential for increased uh, um, adverse events increases, and you've shown that in, in, in some uh, prior studies, even before what you presented with the data here. But in the thymectomy trial, one of the reasons to go on azathioprine was intolerable side effects from prednisone. And so does the AEU, did you correct for that, or does it discriminate it well enough when you choose which medications the patients are on? Because uh, you noted that the azathioprine group, the numbers were higher on the AEU scale. Yeah, um, I think maybe that's a work in progress, Gil. We're still analyzing. This is just preliminary data. But yeah, I mean, there was definitely a strong signal. It was over three years, too. So those scores were higher for the duration of the whole study. All right. Well, thank you to our speakers. And I'll invite Sam to close off the session. Right. This will not be the long goodbye. I just really want to thank all of you, our little group here that stuck with us until the very end. Thank you so much. It was another wonderful scientific session. Thank you for spending your morning with us and certainly for supporting this important program for MGFA. It's so amazing to hear about all of the wonderful research and findings and to just have a day of listening, learning, and sharing together. Um, I do want to thank our steering committee members again, um, Dr. Habib Castro, doctors Habib Castro and Goyar. I just want to thank you all for your leadership, for your several months of planning. It is no small thing. Thank you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Anna Punga, for talking to us about biomarker development in MG. That was very, very exciting. When she said she saw something on the horizon in the next few years, there was a collective gasp in the room, so that was really exciting. Um, thank you to Dove 11, our staff lead on the event, who plan, who plan, I'm sorry, takes the better part of a year to plan it. I'm trying to talk so quickly to you guys. <laughs> And um, I also want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, we, we don't do this alone. It's, um, it's very costly for us to be able to host events like this. And our partners are just phenomenal. And they're there every step of the way with us. So I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Alexion, Argenix, UCB, Regeneron, Immunivant, Janssen, and Horizon Therapeutics. So thank you to our sponsors very much. And lastly, I want to thank all of our speakers for the day who took the time and energy to plan their talks for you guys and to share their findings and to share their expertise. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate the support. So enjoy the rest of the conference, guys.